Hey guys, it's uh, it's Alex. It's uh, been a long time since I posted on this uh, channel, and I just made a a very hardcore decision, like a pedal to the metal type of decision. Something that uh, I don't think most people not could do, but would do, if that's a fair assessment. And it's just it's time to celebrate, and it's a time to mourn. It's a time to accept that some things have died and some things are now to live. I love... Boop. I don't even know where to start with this. I will say, for everything moving forward in this video, I credit everything to this man, Jaco de Molay, or Jaco de Molloy, the last Grandmaster of the Templars, who was burnt at the stake by Pope Clement and King John of France. Um, God rest his soul. I left the Orthodox Church, although I still have some ingrained type of... Um, mannerisms that I do in times of stress um, and there was enough of that tradition that rang true on a, on a very um, on a level of gnosis that uh, I'm to implement in my future traditions there's I mean you walk into a Protestant church or a Roman Catholic church and if you're like me and I assume that most people subscribe to this channel are in this regard more specifically given the commonality and the stories I've heard of feeling like you're being suffocated or the air is heavy never felt that I brought a Satanist friend of mine to the Orthodox Church and they left being like wow like that's the first time I've been in a church that felt genuinely holy like there was good people good energy and they're great people but there's enough of it um, that I can't accept um, you know there's a few things in regards to picking up the sword and their aversion to it, their death to the world mentality, which is useful on so many levels and help kind of get my head right. Um, but, uh, even like I'm just secretly worshiping the monad. I'm secretly worshiping Brahman and I'd rather follow a Hyperborean tradition in which I can be honest with my relationship with God, you know? instead of like appropriating another group of people's theology in private and being a heretic I'd rather just be open and honest with my love for God and my belief in pantheism um, you know I'd rather serve the monad in the most honest and open way but I, I'm still a Christian a Gnostic in, in many regards although not in the anti-cosmic sense of um, you know like the whole Buddhist samsara mentality where the Demiurge, Yaldabaoth, uh, Elohim, Yahweh, uh, Nithogger, in which this parasite, this worm, this piece of absolute dog shit created all of this as a prison that we need to escape from to be with the monad. No, this world was propagated from the monad. It was propagated from source and the Demiurge is a liar. It's a being that exists outside of Yggdrasil, outside of reality. A being that is scared of Tiamat, Diana, Kalima. This this being lives in the void and like wraps itself around the roots of the tree of life um, and envies everything that is existence, everything that is our world. This being's sole pursuit is to tear away at ley lines on earth, to violate sacred sites, to violate children, to make covenants and pacts that cut the flesh off a baby's pecker, um, to break the seals, to break the pillars. Uh, also, that gives a commonality with the Order of the Nine Angles that believe if they can break the seals and the pillars, they'll become anti-cosmic gods. Again, another group that was tricked by the Demiurge. Um, it's easy to think in, in these terms, um, you know, but uh, I, I absolutely will not um, 
associate with such a vile, vile, malice type of anathema. I will not ever interact with archons or any type of terrible, terrible creature like that. No, and I won't be associated with people that associate with that. So when I also refer to Christ, um, know that I'm not like some Christ cuck Christian that my uh, occultist friends are going to be like, oh, he's, he's turned evangelical on us. No, my, my Christ is not Jewish. My Christ is Dolph Lundgren. Well, not literally. I, I, I can't say what my Christ is, so you're an adult. Use the cross association with Dolph Lundgren and you get what I mean. Um, I don't believe Jesus was Jewish. I believe he was an alchemist. I believe he had the full knowledge of Atlantis and the Hyperborean tradition. And I think he was honestly sent here as a blood sacrifice to rescue us from the Demiurge, to rescue us from Yaldabaoth. Uh, sin is a curse, and he was the curse breaker. Um, I believe that Christ was uh, a human uh, manifestation of Brahman, a manifestation of Source, a manifestation of the Monad. I think he was literally this avatar of kind of like Vishnu, Shiva, and Brahma. <sighs> you know, the more masculine counterpart to Tiamat. Um, just like this incarnation of Source. Um, and my tradition derives from this type of um, thing where basically Christ, um, it, like his goal, um, in my opinion, like Christ, um, to, to understand why he died, why he was put on the cross, you have to understand Jewish blood sacrifice, um, why they would slaughter lambs, chickens, why they still do that in the Brooklyn Festival, um, and why they just sacrifice through red heifers, not going to get into that. This is essentially that the firmament around Earth is um, this condom, so to speak. It's the shell of the fruit on the tree, our dimension, our timelines, our, our very world. Um, and it is this barrier that protects us from unreality, that protects us from things that are not bound by conventional terms of metaphysics and spirituality or even science. Um, a very imperceivable horrifying existence or lack thereof. And some things are so hardy they've managed to survive. And these things, they don't have the privilege of entering our world. They don't. They don't have the uh, ability, you know. Um, and this world treats them as parasites, right? So um, the, the tree in which our world is in, Midgard, um, reacts with antibodies um, whenever that you know it gets root rot whenever there's something trying to eat away at the tree um, so there's avatars there's manifestations there's um, you know there's Wotan there is uh, Kitty there's uh, Hare Krishna there's Jesus there's a another person I can't say on here um, who was <laughs> within some, some of our people's lifetimes. Um, can't say who that is. Um, <laughs> anyways, um, you know, there were instances uh, where these, these beings, you, if you play ESO, uh, think of Molek Ball trying to anchor himself into Nern from Oblivion, from Cold Harbor. Um, he could only do that when Metamarco um, violated the sanctity of Nern, right? And similarly enough, kind of like Stephen King's The Dark Tower, there are towers that bind reality in the Elder Scrolls series. So when these towers are removed, there are layers of protection that are removed. There's layers of instability. Um, and these seals aren't necessarily literal, physical things that can be broken, but more like acts. So, um, in my opinion... God is this neutral force. It's like a tree, you know? If a tree uh, and its branch falls 
and it impales you, it's not because the tree hates you, right? Who would look at a tree and be like, that murdered my family member, you know? But also, we don't necessarily look at the tree that gives us fruit and think, this tree likes us. Maybe some people do, I guess. Kitty, stop it. But, um, anyways, um, I, I view God as this neutral force, like the sun. You know, the sun gives us vitamin D, uh, it also gives us melanoma, but it also maintains this constant cycle of life, death, and rebirth. That's how I view the monad, that's how I view this God that I speak of, that I serve. Um, you know, so basically God is innocent, right? Well, I mean, what do we associate with innocence? Cats? What makes this cat innocent, right? What would make you look at another human being and go, well, this person uh, is not as innocent as a cat? Because this person has done stuff. They've learned stuff. They've seen stuff that they can't unsee. This is an absent-minded animal. We can try to project our human qualities into it and say that it loves us, but uh, if I die in this room and it runs out of food, it's going to eat my corpse. This is an animal. A filthy, smelly animal. You know, that's why we think of babies as innocent, because babies are fucking stupid. You know, they, they're not even fully aware of their own existence. They're just, they, they're, they're there and they're chilling. It's the same thing with God. They're, when you have infinity, there is uh, no morality, you know, um, because there's no desire, right? Everything is fulfilled. Desire comes from this inherent lack thereof. You know, like ties into pessimism, thermodynamics, entropy, the will, uh, everything is kind of just this, like every point, like uh, survival, survival comes from mortality, you know, having limited resources, fighting for your survival, fighting against the elements, um, this forms solidarity, community, common goals, um, you know, biology creates morality. So from the primordial soup, that's where morality comes from. The more limited something is, the more determined something is. Um, and with this determination comes purpose, comes reason. Um, you know, so if you have something that is completely infinite, um, there is no desire, right? So, I mean, you could think of what is our world? It's stardust. It, we are from a dead star. Isn't it ironic that this big ball of fire that projects almost infinite energy um, doesn't have a consciousness? It's just this this force that is exists, and yet something as insignificant as a microscopic bit of stardust can make a YouTube video. See what I mean? <sighs> Morality comes from people surviving, you know, honor, chivalry, the, these are all human traits, you know, and I think we often project this onto the divine. However, the sun still gives us life, and as a result, it furthers our purpose, you know, so I think the end of nihilism is the beginning of morality, and the end of morality is the beginning of nihilism, and I think it's an Ouroboros. I don't think that nihilism and moral objectivism are necessarily exclusive, even though people will tell you it is. I have a more monistic type of view on that. Um, but, uh, you know, God is innocent for the same reason a baby is innocent, because it's not fully aware of its own existence. Um, it's kind of just, it's, it's, it's pure. It hasn't been untainted, right? So, there is a seal of innocence. Um, part of our quantum reality, a part of our physics, a part of the makeup, the building blocks of our universe, of the firmament, of that that separates us from other dimensions and other layers of existence for good reason. Um, in the seal of innocence, it's not a physical object. So um, with <laughs> that, that raises a question, you know, how can you destroy something that's not uh, something that you can physically destroy? Well, as above, so below. As the world I see it here, so does so below. There are um, varying degrees of metaphors in the spirit world that are their equivalent of our literal manifestations of things. 
um, you know, the uh, Plato's epistemology of the realm of ideals uh, comes to mind. You know, it's like we look at a chair, but what makes it a chair, right? Well, it has legs, it has all this stuff. Yes, but that is still a piece of wood arranged in a certain way. We just have the idea of it being a chair. So that what what gives it the innate chairness? Well, what we attribute to it. So we're attributing it to it. So there's nothing of its own existence that necessarily makes it a chair. And in the spirit world, because I believe the spirit world and the physical world are one. They're um, they're part of the same thing. They're just reflections of each other. They're not separate, but they are distinct, right? And they bleed into each other enough to where um, you know the soul of the chair, the idea of the chair makes us think this is a chair. But in the spirit world, you would see a, what looks like a physical chair, but it would be the idea of the chair, if that makes sense. Um, so, in this sense, um, if you have an object that doesn't exist, but there's a meaning behind the object, if you invert the meaning, um, you invite evil, right? Isn't that right? Exactly. Um, so, if you were to destroy this innocence, to violate the sanctity of the firmament, the thing that guards us from the outer realms, so to speak, outworld, um, well, what would you do? So, the Demiurge's idea is, let me make a pact with some people that are struggling to survive in the desert. Let me promise them the world, wealth, financial institutions, media... Right? In exchange, they slice the skin off of the baby. What are you doing? You're slicing the skin off an innocent being. You're stripping away the sanctity and innocence of God, the monad, Brahman. Um, so you break that seal, and it just further makes the pillar a little, uh, puts a little crack in it, right? And from that crack, the demiurge seeps through that. So he has much more of a, of, a, of a psychic manifestation in our realm. And uh, he can further do this. And the more seals that are broken, it wouldn't be too far-fetched to assume that maybe a hydron collider or something, I don't know, just, just throwing out ideas, throwing poo at the wall. But um, with enough seals broken, you could possibly have a physical portal open up, and God knows what's on the other end. Um you would have an increase in paranormal phenomena if these barriers that separate our worlds start to break more spooky shit is going to happen globally um, this increase in it represents the destabilization of reality so if this being is given more and more control over reality it can be it can give more gifts and more incentive for people to further um, do uh, horrible things either to children to women um, to create um, a type of, you know, economy, a type of capitalist society um, that is anti-nature, that is anti-human, you know, that's anti-communalism, uh, that exists to strip the world, and thus, in a metaphorical, proverbial sense, strip, strip reality, right? So, all of these things are kind of um, connected in its own way, um, you know? And I don't want to be a part of it. Um, I'd like to have a more functional relationship with the monad, with Brahman. I'd like to make the hard decisions and not be bound by what I view as an inherently evil, sinister, archon type of system. I don't want... Um, I believe that these people, if you can even call them that, that created this idea of wealth, wealth, status, things that don't exist in nature. I'm going to be honest. The only things that exist in nature is a raw meat diet, having kids, and having community. This is like the three main things of life. And, well, let's see, everyone's vegan. They're starving to death. Everyone um, is getting cats and dogs instead of kids. Um, and everyone is socially isolating themselves online. You know, that's another seal that's broken, which could be repaired if we were to act human again, I would say. Um, you know, so... Uh, you know, these, these types of things are, are very important to me, um, to, to choose to step outside of all of this and um, not be bound by it, to try to do my best to heal the world the best I can, right? And this is such a, 
a burden, you know, every part of my fiber wants to live an easy life, wants to be a normie, wants to have that white picket fence and just be oblivious to the world around me, like most people, you know, just to have nice things. That wasn't what the monad had intended for me. That's not what reality had intended for me. And every time, uh, I'm sure you know this, if you've followed a spiritual path, and you're being called by this greater force, and you avoid it, your life becomes more and more difficult. You, just a lot of unfortunate events, a lot of shortcomings, uh, whether that's poverty, mental illness, whatever it is. But then when you start to go where you're meant to go, uh, things start to feel right, you know, in, in a way that like you could question whether or not that means we don't have free will and we're just pawns and some Lovecraftian chessboard. But um, when... You know, I've denied destiny long enough, and uh, I don't want to do that anymore. Um, I want to do the right thing, you know. Um, I remember um, after my friend died, when I was eight years old, she died of terminal cancer. This was a person that showed me the best of humanity. You know, when I was younger, I was molested by a boy older than me. I was beaten by a special needs teacher every day repeatedly. My parents would fight and throw stuff. I had just this rough background. And there's this little girl that knew she was going to die, that was in a wheelchair, that had her eyes sunken to the back of her head, someone who was just falling apart at the seams. And all she ever wanted was for people to be kind to each other. She you know, showed me humanity where I thought there was none. She was that light in the darkness. Um, she inspired me to stay alive, right? And I remember, you know, there were many nights where I would pray to God and just ask, like, why, why wasn't it me? I have survivor's guilt. I have PTSD. Um, you know, I would pray and just ask to wake up when I'm not on earth anymore. Um, you know, I wanted to be with my friend, you know, this, this embodiment of humanity. She was like, uh, even as a 23 year old, I don't think I've met a person as good as her. You know, she was one of the best in the fact that she was just taken so soon. You know, I often was at a concert in Maryland the other day, VNV Nation, and I was crying in the middle of uh, the, the whole thing because, you know, I just thought to myself, man, um, if she was still alive, I wonder if she would have liked this or if she would have thought it was dog shit. You know, I, I just, I, I, it's hard for me to enjoy these things that other people enjoy because the survivor's guilt in me thinking, you know, like, why am I here? <laughs> you know, it, given all this beauty and this privilege, and she's not, you know. Um, but amongst my, my lamentations and my issues with God, um, one prayer I made was I said to God, I, um, with this hope that Bianca inspired in me, um, I said, God, I want to have left this world having given more than I've taken from it. I remember that as a, as a kid. I remember growing up and like <laughs> Revelation 21, 6 is my favorite. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Um, those who thirst will be given the waters of life freely. Um, you know, that self-sacrifice in Fallout 3, I was a little kid and I was so optimistic of what the world would be like. And most little kids, they, uh, you know, they, they want to become a firefighter or a politician or whatever it is. I said, I want to die so someone else could have clean drinking water. How many little kids say that, you know? Um, I used to pray whenever ambulances went by and, uh, some of my family would say that it made them uncomfortable. And I stopped, you know, and I've been trying to get in that habit where I see an ambulance come by and I just want to, like, it's hard for me because I was just, it was shut off, right? I was shamed for it. Um, but I, I'd, I'd like to pray for, you know, ambulances that go by and just be like, God, I, I hope everything's all right. You know, I hope um, the best for whoever, you know. I just found myself perpetually raised under materialism. Hold on. You know, as a little kid, I um, I remember <laughs> being around my great grandmother. She was born in the 1920s, and her moral values, her belief that there was purpose, there was reason, and there was a greater reason um, that what against our own conveniences, 
um, to be here all the way up till the end. She never doubted whether or not there was a, a purpose, whether there was a reason to life. You know, she died with no regrets. Um, I want to die that way. Um, I remember just seeing my family, these individualist, these liberals, these uh, materialist, um, and just thinking, you know, as a little kid, why is my great grandmother the only one in my family that's normal, right? I never felt like this life was my own, right? I know there's all these Luciferians and these people that uh, believe they're their own god and their own person, whatever it is. As a little kid, I it never made any sense to me. I always thought, you know, I just I like I had blood memory essentially. I remember uh, when we were in elementary school. Um, you know, basically, they'd have this cryptograph, this cipher, where you'd write the entire alphabet and then put made-up symbols underneath, right? I remember um, making my own language, writing in it, learning how to read in it. And I remember around, like, I think it was 17 years old, I found it. It was in a drawer, and I, I was uh, getting into a Satru and all that, um, studying Norse mythology. I read this, and it scared the living shit out of me. I'm going to be honest, I've died two times. First of a drowning, the second of pneumonia. I've experienced that cold, dark void. And this scared me a lot more than that. I crumpled it up and threw it away. Because it was pure Anglo-Saxon foodark. As a little kid with no source of reference, I was writing in Old English. Um, I was writing in, in Anglo-Saxon foodark. I was writing in... In old English. It still fucks with me to this day. Um, I'd remember, I'd have dreams as a kid about redcoats marching throughout the earth, um, you know, and just being raised and told by my mother that our family had blood doesn't matter, none of that matters. You're your own person, don't be bound by the past, you know, grow your branches and be happy, do your own thing, choose what you want out of life. And I don't know why, like, I don't know where this came from, but I said to my mom, how can you extend the branches and grow the, 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 the limbs of the tree? If you cut the tree at its very roots, if you, you define life by this tree extending its branches, um, you know, where does it draw its nourishment? It draws it from the soil. You know, all of this life for this puny little branch, this, this, this seedling, right? Um, it all comes from the ground. It comes from the bones of our ancestors. So, doesn't that make the dead more alive than us? Just saying. I, uh, I just never felt like I was my own per person being told, you know, spend money on what you want to do, be who you want to be. I just felt more and more dead inside, just perpetually dead inside. Like this, this void just kept growing bigger and bigger, especially when I became an Ayn Rand objectivist, when I read Atlas Shrugged, um, you know, all of this, when I believe people were greedy, you know, life's too short to be miserable, you know, if you're, you're going to die one day, there's no purpose to your life, no meaning, so you might as well just enjoy yourself, you know, and spend your money on the things you like to do, right? No gods, no masters. <sighs> I was so on the edge of oblivion at that point. And, you know, I can't say what changed that. In 2016, uh, a certain cultured individual, a very thuggish individual, introduced me to a type of worldview that, that was the complete opposite of conservatism and liberalism, the complete opposite of uh, social liberalism and economic liberalism. Can't get into that for reasons, but it uh, changed my perspective on a lot of things, but I still constantly fell short of that, right? And just growing up and every bit of our society is, is just aimed towards making us believe that there's no reason to be here. You know, everything, our schools, our media, our movies, TV shows, everything's just to inspire nihilism, you know, consumerism. <sighs> to believe that, you know, we're supposed to work this nine to five, pay rent to people that view us as a statistic instead of a human being in their dwellings. Um, you know, just making money from bosses that don't give a fuck about us. Um, you know, it's just being constantly downtrodden and believe that this is the reason why we're here, you know? When for thousands of years, whether it was gods, heroes, whatever, we had this mythos. As society, we always united together for a greater goal, a greater purpose, a greater reason to be here. Um, 
you know, we, we didn't go to work to make money for our career. We went to work for our aunts, our uncles, our mothers, fathers, daughters, sons, cousins, everyone. You know, our grandparents. That was family, and not this nuclear family conservative bullshit. It was our community, you know. And um, it's always how things have been, you know, th throughout history. That's the one thing Karl Marx is right on, you know. For most of human history, we've been communist in that sense. Although he's a dialectical materialist, and I'm an anti-materialist, so there's going to be some disagreements. You know, they say a broken clock is right twice a day. Um, but, uh, you know, this world always just felt unnatural. It always felt homesick for a place I wasn't quite sure existed. Um, it never felt right to me. Everything felt um, poisoned, you know. And, um, you know, it's just to believe that something is true, right? When every aspect of your society, your family, your culture tells you there's, it isn't true, um, that is, like, if you were willing to put your stock in something, anything, in spite of all of that, in spite of the odds, then that is profound. Even if it's a lie, it's profound. Um... You have these people that believe in basic morality, basic right and wrong, and, um, you know, whether this is from a, a religious, a lukewarm religious background, or whatever it is, or secularist politics, doesn't matter, this basic form of ethics, you have people that, um, are, are just very, um, like, are academics, right? Um, you know, the communists and the liberals, uh, atheists, all these people will agree that uh, animals, you know, you could breed a dog for a certain thing, you could breed a cat for a certain thing, you could create a form of livestock, a form of beast of burden, uh, you know, an animal for hunting, whatever it is, you can essentially breed traits into every form of life. But when there's this mystical creature called man, there's just an exception, where every form of life is bound to the rules of nature, right? But then when it's humans, that we're our own individuals, we are our own gods, whatever, there's no binding thing, you know? And uh, it gets worse over the generations now. Are people that are supposed to be not superstitious, supposedly um, rationally minded, re you know, well grounded? These people can't even tell what their own gender is, you know. And these are the people that are supposed to be anti-superstitious and pro-science, and they teach us in schools things that are just equivalent to flat Earth. You know, there's just always been this uh, this delusion, this delirium, and I've always wanted to escape from it, and I've never quite found a way to do so, you know? And I know a lot of people don't think that it's right, um, but a lot of people don't know what to do, you know? And when you have the elites that create the system of wealth, of money, you know, they will um, have all of their made-up money, at, you know, at the top of the hierarchy, and if you believe in their system, and they put you on the bottom, you are the bottom of it. But if you realize that, uh, like, our fiat currency, um, um, you know, our USD, isn't backed by anything, not even something as superficial as gold, you know, you realize it's just a piece of paper that only is valuable because these pedophiles in the Pentagon, in the Treasury, tell us it is valuable. Hmm, well, that doesn't quite sit right with me, if we're being honest. You know, but, uh, if you could escape that, you know, in ancient Germanic times, these Germanic chieftains would wear gold rings, right? This, this is a symbol of monetary wealth. And they believed that their wealth was in their people, in their families, in their friends. You know, that their, that their tribe was their money, was their wealth. And they were so against this monetary wealth that when they walked through crowds of starving people, they'd rip the gold rings off in disgust of the material world and throw it into the crowd. You know, is, fuck it, you know, this isn't real. But you people are, you know. Um, it's like Marcus Aurelius, you know, this man, emperor of the known world at the time, you know, he could have slept in, right? He was the boss of everyone. No one's going to tell him to get up early for work. He got up for work early anyways. The man could have had any type of bed, any type of silks he wanted, and he would sleep naked on the cold floor with just a bowl of water and some bread to remind himself of what his fellow 
man had to go through in the streets of Rome, you know? Um, and, and I've always thirsted for something that mattered more to me than bread and water alone, you know? I remember when I was a little kid, my dad gave me, like, uh, I think it was $200 for my birthday, all right? And I donated one half to the ASPCA and the other to St. Jude's because I had a friend that died of cancer and I don't want anyone else to live through that nightmare ever again. Um, and I also like the idea of a starving pup being able to be given kibble, you know. And that filled me with an immense joy, right? But living in this kind of society, my dad yelled at me. He scolded me. He said, really? You just wasted your money towards some bullshit charity, right? You know, why couldn't you have spent that on something that actually mattered? Why couldn't you have, uh, you know, bought in something you like? A toy, you know, a video game, something, but you had to waste it on this. <sighs> you know, and I, and I can't be mad at him because this is the way people believe reality is. This is the way people believe the world is. Um, you know, I can't be mad at him. I don't hold it against him. It's just the way we conceptualize things. We are really that brainwashed into believing that this system is real. Um, and, you know, it just made, brought me joy. It brought me joy to smash my PS4 with a hatchet, right? This matrix, instead of jacking my head into some world that doesn't exist, you know, destroying that, you know, brought me a peace of mind and a, an appreciation for the moment, an appreciation for my mortality, an appreciation for the world around me. Um, that I just didn't have when I played video games, if I'm being quite honest. My dad, again, was like, you could have sold that, and you could have gotten money. You could have gotten money, right? I'm, I was like, you know, there's some things that where if you live your life for just money, and you keep doing this and keep doing this, you could, you could be successful by every caliber, every definition, every standard, every creed. You know, you could have this, this car, this 401k, this house, all this stuff, right? But the one thing you cannot buy um, is a peace of mind, right? You know, it's like you could have all this money, but can you purchase the lack of regret? You know, you'll die with that. I can't take any of this stuff with me when I go. I can't. I can't take any of my books, any of my figurines. I can't take these fucking ugly cats. I can't... Uh, I can't take these fucking overpriced shoes with me. Like, what, what, like no. I can't take that with me. Um, you can take love, right? And, and, you know, it reminds me of Joshua Graham's AI-generated quote, you know, the fire that kept me alive, um, you know, or, was, or the fire that burned inside of me um, burned brighter than the fire around me, you know, that... It was God's love, you know, and I know what my life has been without God. You know, people say, what do you imagine hell as? Um, you know, do you imagine pitchforks and torches and uh, some sadomasochism? You know, for me, I look at my life without idealism. I look at my life when it was just down to money and material objects. I look at my life without God, and I would say that that is hell, you know. Before I found God, before I found purpose... It, that that was hell, right? I couldn't imagine a worser fate um, than it, than denying the monad, than denying Brahman. I I can't do it anymore, and that's what money serves as an alternative to God, uh, as an alternative to family, as an alternative to to nation. That's what it is, um, you know. And uh, well, I, I I think of. You know, all the, these people that my friends, you know, my generation grew up with, that they looked up to, you know, Hugh Hefner, all these people, Elon Musk. And I think about the people that I wanted to aspire to be like. I think of how they went out, and uh, I think, you know, I kind of want to go out that way too, right? I want to be burnt at the stake, you know. I want to be crucified. I want to be ridiculed, you know. If, uh, as Christ said, you know, they... The world may hate you, but remember the world hated me first. Um, you know, I want to pick up that cross. I want those deep marks in my back. I don't want to live a life of regret anymore. I don't want desire. I don't want sexuality. I don't want money. I don't want it. I want to be like a Knights Templar. You know, um, 
and I believe in chivalry. Um, you know, opening doors for women, buying women food, things like that. Throwing my coat in the puddle, even though she knows she can walk around it. Things like that. I remember there was this Mexican kid. I uh, can't remember his name, so I'm just going to call him Pablo. Is that racist? I don't I don't care. Um, so Pablo was an Ayn Rand objectivist. He was a former co-worker of mine. And, you know, I was talking about how I just wish I could give up all of my material items. I wish I could give up on the system. I wish I could deny myself these pleasures that everyone else feels entitled to. I wish I could escape the system and break my chains. And he said, what the fuck? That's just delusional. That you're literally insane. He was like, dude, the, your your values, your virtues, they're not going to be reciprocated. People are going to laugh at you, right? They're going to think of you as an oddity, a relic. You know, it would be one thing if you grew up in a society um, where that's uh, you know, if you grew up in a society where that was expected of you, right? Where your good manners, your gentlemanly behavior. Uh, was expected and you would be rewarded off of that because to him everything exists in this monetary exchange so to him virtue is as superficial as it only works in a society where it's expected of you that's how you survive that's how you form relationships friendships is is through a societally expected virtue right and um you know now everyone uh, they don't care about that no one believes that in purpose anymore no one believes that there's a reason to be here, you know, and he said, man, I can't imagine you wasting your life away. A man that is entitled to happiness, a man that is entitled to love, a man that is entitled to the world, you know, and you have only so long here, so why would you waste it? Why would you throw it all away for something that doesn't matter? We're all inherently greedy, and that's all right. We're all inherently selfish. We're selfish because we exist to enjoy ourselves, right? To love ourselves, to look after ourselves, right? Um, and that's that's not what we are. You know, our closest relatives, the, uh, what is it, the Pinobos? Pen Pinobo, I don't know. Uh, relatives to the chimpanzees, they're, they're communal. They care about each other. They love each other. They die for each other. That's our closest relatives. These, you know, everyone wants to have this alpha wolf mentality. They want to compare themselves to a crocodile or, God forbid, a fucking furry. Um, you know, everyone's like, I'm a big alpha male. And it's like, we're not a part of a wolf pack. We're a part of a troop. We are primates. We fuck each other up. We fight. We kill each other. We also love each other. We die for each other. We look out for each other. Our worth is in each other, not ourselves. That's how we evolved, right? It always amazed me. Frederick Nietzsche's conclusions of morality, you know, oh, God is dead, or rather, people don't believe in morality anymore. So we need to create a new set of values that is better suited, that's more life-affirming. So he creates the Ubermitch, right? And I really think, you know, if there was any credibility, any rationality to Frederick Nietzsche, it would have been that he mistake humans, right? Instead of writing about man, he was writing about a jaguar or a crocodile, a solitary species that only interacts with each other when it comes to reproduction, right? But instead, he oddly referred to the solitary narcissistic behavior, uh, this predatory mentality to, to mankind. I'd say that my beliefs are very Luciferian or very ubermitch uh, existential nihilism if the ubermitch was the collective godhead, if it was the collective conclusion of society. If, it, if the ubermitch, the superman, wasn't any one individual, but was the effort of what happens when these weak individuals unite into an unstoppable and unbreakable force. That's what I would consider the uber Mitch, if I'm being quite honest. Um, you know, just, uh, you know, I said to him, I said to Pablo, I said, uh, hold on. I said to Pablo, um, doesn't it just, like, Look past everything in society, the way everything is built, the way you were raised, everything. Look deep within your heart. Look deep within yourself. And if not your soul, which you don't believe exists, look deep within your mind and ask yourself, does this feel right? Like, drop drop your guard. Drop all of your beliefs. Just, just look into yourself and ask yourself, does this seem right to you? Do you really want this for yourself or other people? Do you really want this? And he just paused for a moment. 
and the honesty in his facial expression and his body language. He looked at me and he said, no, but it's too late. See, I mean, when, when the guard is dropped, these people that say that this is life, this is empowering, do your own thing, live and let live, it's not that they're running towards something, it's that they're admitting defeat, you know? They, they're, they, they give up. That's what it is. I, I don't, I don't want to give up. <laughs> I don't. I don't have it in me to give up. Maybe I'm a masochist, but I refuse to develop such a defeatist mentality. If anything, I see these people acting like uh, these these pedophiles, these these greedy capitalist corporatists, these 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 celebrities, this this consumerism, these people that are just paranoid and hate each other. I see all this self-interest and all this materialism. I see people acting like literal animals, savages. And you know, I don't see. Oh, well, this is the rest of the world. You know, I um, I should just give up. You know, they're they're acting like this, and when in Rome, do as the Romans do. <sighs> Instead, I see everyone acting this way, and I'm like, no, we need to draw a line in the sand. We will not act like animals. So, in that regard, I see the weakness around me as an excuse to be stronger than the weakness around me. I don't see it as a sign of, well, this is what I should do, this is what I should envy, this is what I should be a part of. Instead, I see it as a sign of what not to do. And ask yourself this, if you live in a society of virtue, and everything's expected of you, and you choose to embrace and live by these values, these, these idealisms, uh, this, this romanticism, and it's expected of you, you're rewarded either monetarily or whatever through social credibility, um, and it's not where your heart's at, is it really virtue at that point? Is it that maybe this Kali Yuga, this Ragnarok, this Revelations, this departure of the, of the world of sanity and sobriety, is it that, you know, this is the breeding grounds for our collective suicide, or is this the, the fertile, the fresh, fertile soil in, wheat, in which the wheat can grow and the wheat can be cut from the chaff? You know, I, I'm sick of being a part of the herd. I'm sick of it. It makes me fucking sick, if I'm being honest. Um, I'm sick of it. I'd rather, you know, be the last of my family to believe what I believe. I'd rather be the last person, the last male in my generation. I'd rather see the, the, the sky blackened with arrows as the demons are in front of me. And I'd rather die alone, being impaled in every orifice by every sharp object. I'd rather die in pain and agony, knowing that I'm the last. I'd rather, you know, you know, just die with meaning. At least die knowing that I did the right thing, than live perpetually knowing that I am wasting everything that has been given to me. I can't do it, man. You know... I've said for many years that uh, I believed in idealism, that I wanted to help people. It was, it, was a, it was a facade. I was just a very angry, bitter, hateful, empty person, you know. I said of all the things I wanted, but I didn't do much. I had all these flags on my wall of all these great men that died carrying them, and I hadn't bled a fucking goddamn day in my life, you know. I, I regret that a lot. I remember... Um, when I uh, was making 18.50 an hour at Walmart, this is the first time in my life where I was making a significant amount of money. I came from nothing. I went from making seven dollars an hour, uh, or not rather, fourteen, which is essentially seven in New York. Anyways, um, I went from just making just minimum wage and slowly climbing the corporate ladder and making a lot of money. And I wanted to celebrate, man. I wanted. I. I. I looked in the mirror and I saw something that I fucking hated, right? I had this very insole mentality, despite not being a virgin, um, I, where, you know, I just, I, all these, these expectations, you know, ruining my uh, social interactions with women because I was a coomer, a gooner, right? 
Um, I was a degenerate. I was an Elliot Rogers. I was a creep. I was a pervert. You know, I remember being this fat, overweight, greasy neck beard, and um, you know, just this thing thinking of women as opportunities rather than people seeing pussy instead of a person, right? Um, being a, a horny dog in which my sensibilities, my greater sensibilities, were negated by the second brain, so to speak. Um, before I quit pornography and also fight the new drug, um, <laughs> but, um, you know, it's just, um, I remember I ended up with this, this beautiful English girl named Abby, beautiful, just, just amazing, um, I was with her for a while, and I, I don't know how I got this lucky, you know, I, uh, I would cry in the mirror because I just saw this fat job of the hut, this ugly, filthy lard, right? And I was just this, this creepy insul, and um, I, I, I kept saying to myself, I want, I want, I want to look like a Greek god. I want chiseled abs. I want to look like Ragnar Lothbrok. Um, and, and I was just this Shrek. I was Shrek essentially. I was Peter Griffin, um, with a. A, quag a quagmire mentality, I suppose. Um, maybe not quite that bad. But, um, yeah. And, um, <laughs> here's the thing. Um, yeah, like, me and this girl, uh, Abby, were, it was very raunchy, our interactions. I'll spare you the details. <sighs> but I remember I, was, I sent her a photo of me shirtless. And she liked it for whatever reason. Like, man, how do you, like, this is the you know, one in a 1,000, the needle in the haystack for all fucking losers and creeps, you know, it's like, instead of, like, changing, you know, your moral values, you know, be developing self-discipline, doing the right thing, and being the kind of person you'd want to be with, I, this was a genuine exception. It wasn't an example, it was an exception, like, this just generally doesn't happen, so the fact that it happened to me, I think, was a test from God. I think it was a test from the monad, I think it was a test from Brahman, it was a test by Christ, really, um, because I, she, I said, I, I said to her, I want to lose weight, I want to not hate what I see in the mirror, I want abs, I want to bulk up, and she said, ew, abs are disgusting, and I was like, are, are you kidding me, um, and she said, I'm only interested in guys with dad bods, you know, the un unhealthy, unhygienic, uh, uh, loser types, and I'm like, that's what you think of me? <laughs> you know, um, and I just, I, I flipped out. <laughs> I flipped out. I, this is when I knew I had integrity, where I knew I could live past this, where I, where I was a better man than what I was, than what I settled with, right? That I knew I could be better tomorrow than the person I was yesterday, because I said to her, you know, I'm, well, I'm sorry, no amount of pussy is ever going to, uh, you know, be a good exchange for a peace of mind and self, uh, self-worth. Um, I said to her, I'm sure there's no shortage of fat, uh, alcoholic men in Scotland and Ireland, um, go there, as I don't want that, and <laughs> we stopped talking. Um, but, you know, I chose, uh, you know, I, I chose wanting to become healthier, um, to think healthier, to live healthier over a woman, over, you know, uh, just taking the most sacred act on earth that is used to produce life and just turning it into something casual. I mean, casual sex is just not a thing. Like, how can, like, sex by definition isn't casual, so I, I don't understand this hookup culture, you know. Um, and I chose, I chose um, that over her, right? I felt like shit afterwards, and I had people guilt trip me, more materialist, right? They said, you found the one woman that accepted you for who you are, you know, and you you chose, you know, just, like, because, like, what? You you just chose this alternate type of thing where, where for the most superficial reasons, you want to look good, so you're going to push away the woman that loves you, and I said, man... 
I want a woman that loves me for the person I want to be. I want a woman that has my same values. I want a woman that prays for me um, when I'm not around, that doesn't pray because I pray. I want a woman that prays for me and that I can pray for uh, when she's not around, right? I don't want a woman that accepts where I'm at. I want a woman that will grow with me um, in my values. Um, you know, that's what I wanted, and uh, it's not for me now. We'll get into that. We'll get into where this is inevitably leading to. Um, but yeah, I, uh, yeah, I, you know, in, in regards to this, just, you know, wanting to be proud of who I looked at in the mirror in regards to my, uh, you know, financial success that was short lived because I lost my job. Um, I went to men's warehouse. I bought a $150 waistcoat. I bought a $350 pair of shoes. I bought $90 jeans, uh, designer jeans. I wore, I bought a $90 button up and I looked like a character out of the Peaky Blinders. I looked in the mirror and I felt spiffy. I was so proud of what I saw. I was like, I feel like a gentleman. Like I, I was like, this is great. Right. And then I, you know, I was walking at 3 AM down a trail and I thought about the times where I was given money, where I had a lot of money, right? Um, where, you know, I grew up with nothing. So, um, you know, I, and I, 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 I suffered and I, I know what it is to suffer. I know what it is to feel absolutely worthless and I don't ever want anyone else to feel that way, you know, and that's why I want to help people. Um, but, uh, you know, because, you know, it's, it's like this phenomena where a kid is rescued from an abusive background where they're neglected. And even if they're in a household where they get consistent food, good quality food, they don't even eat it. They just store it up and they hoard it in the corner. Um, you know, and then that's kind of what I did. Because when I would be given a decent amount of money, I would go to the bookstore, I'd go to Barnes & Noble, I'd get books that I will never read. I have over $3,000 worth of books, maybe $4,000 worth of books. Um, I have like a little over 2,000 books, um, you know, and that was, that was something I did. You know, that was my escape, you know, uh, alcohol. I've spent thousands of dollars on alcohol, man. I was so dead inside. I, um, you know, I'm an alcoholic. I hate being sober. Um, I, 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 like, I wish I was drunk right now. It, it is annoying. I, I hate being sober. I hate my sobriety. I wish I didn't. Um, I love my sobriety on an ideal level, but from a practical level, I just can't handle myself when I see alcohol. You know, um, I remember, um, <laughs> it was getting so bad after I was 21 that, uh, I drank an entire six pack of Scottish dark ale in one sitting you know, and I nearly died of alcohol poisoning, and I was like, you know, I, I don't want my family to see that me like this. I don't want my cousins to come across me and, and see that I died this way, like my grandmother did, you know, dying alone on their bedroom floor or their living room floor. I don't want to put other people through this, and that's another thing, you know, being raised and told, it doesn't matter what you do in private. It doesn't matter what personal decisions you make. You're your own individual. And also realizing that I can't have this libertarian um, point of view because I'm a realist as much as I am an idealist. And I realize everything we do in private, all of our personal decisions, personal little preferences, the things we like to do in the dark, they affect more than just ourselves, right? If it was just me in this world, I would be... Uh, in an early grave, I would have drank in like five bottles of vodka and just checked out, right? Um, but unfortunately, like uh, these people that are like, I want to drive without a seat belt, you know, I want to motorcycle without a helmet. So what about the person that has to clean up your splattered brains? What about your family that's going to be crying over your casket? You know, what about the people that love you, your friends? Uh, how are they going to feel at the end of the day when you chose freedom over humanity? You know, um, I, I realized that and that's why I stopped drinking and, you know, and I had a relapse a few months ago where, uh, I was hanging out with a friend at an underground bar and I had, uh, <laughs> I had three glasses of Coke and scotch. I had six shots of Jaegermeister and, uh, one blue ribbon. Oh, 
oh, they, you know, they were like, we're going to give this to you in increments because we don't want you to throw up. And I was like, no. And my, my friend who's an alcoholic who thinks that he could out drink me, um, genuinely, uh, thought that I was a lightweight because I was avoiding alcohol, uh, with willpower. I, w I don't even know how I have, um, you know, that I'm just a, you know, I'm a lush. I am a lush. I am a Scotsman. Um, no, <laughs> uh, um, you know, they were surprised after the six shots of Jaeger my so they're like, I'm, I'm impressed. And I'm like, I'm, it's, I'm not new to the show. Um, but it was just things like that. I was spending money on books, uh, clothing, alcohol. Um, I was doing all these things. Um, and I was just, it was just a slow way to die, essentially, to give up, right? Um, they think that, you know, I already feel dead inside, so why not just try to fill that void with, with, with stuff, with power tools, with, uh, with uh, flags, flags, buying random stuff on Amazon and Etsy and eBay, um, you know, just all this random shit that I didn't need. And it just it kept growing. The void kept growing and growing and growing, and there was just no end to it. You know, I just, I felt so, it just detached. I felt so disassociated. And, you know, I just wanted, I've, all I've ever wanted to do was help people. All I've ever wanted to do was give more back to the earth than I've taken from it before I check out. Um, and I, I broke down crying in the middle of this path at 3 a.m. And um, I, had, I had just this kind of um, dark night of the soul type of moment where I thought of my friend dying of cancer. I thought of my friends that could barely provide, be able to, you know, buy baby formula for their kids. I think of all these people that are suffering in this world, all these people I care about, a self-proclaimed collectivist, right? And every month I would go, oh, I wish I could donate to this cause, this charity, this political group that I like, but I don't have any money. And then meanwhile, I had enough to buy a $300 pair of shoes. I had enough to go buy a big fucking stack of books. I had enough to buy seven different historical flags on Amazon.com. I had all this money to do all this stuff, but yeah, I don't have enough money to donate $10 to an osteosarcoma charity. What the fuck? You know what? No. Like, I broke down and I was like, this is, this isn't right. This is wrong. There's something very fucking wrong here. I, I feel sick. I feel cold. I feel like I'm being dragged into the abyss. You know, I feel dead and I'm alive. I died. I literally died. My heart stopped. I pissed and shit myself. Everything went cold. And the type of cold you feel when you die, hmm. You know, I've stood naked in a blizzard. It was a suicide attempt when I was younger. Um, it was a suicide attempt where I stood naked in a blizzard in below zero temperatures just to freeze to death because I had enough of my abusive background. Um, and I gotta say, it, it, was, it was colder than that, dying. But also I remember that it felt, um, you know, I don't, I, can't, I don't remember what happened after I checked out, but I, I remember, um, you know, it was a lot better than everything that led up to it. That's what I can say. Um, and I'll also say, you never are quite the same person when you come back. I genuinely felt like there was something missing from me when I came back. Um, you know, like I wasn't whole, you know. Um, which, I, is, I guess, is a common phenomena for people that have died. But I gotta say, on that path, on that trail, when, all, when reality just hit me like a truck, like a chariot, I, I felt dead. I felt like a living corpse, you know? And I just, I just said, I can't do this. I can't do this, you know? And I had this profound spiritual experience where I meditated, where I meditated in a dark corner of my room and invoked the spirit of Jacques de Molay. This, this person, this great man, you know? You, you gotta think from an objective point of view, even if you hate Christianity, you hate the Demiurge, all this stuff, you know, the Templars were just this exception, this this oddity. You gotta think about all these knightly groups uh, throughout the Crusades, where they were conscripted, they came from wealthy backgrounds, they were bringing honor to their families, they were doing it for personal reasons, to be war heroes, to do all this stuff, and it was just more money in their pockets, it was for glory, it was for rape, it was for all sorts of stuff, you know, 
you know, uh, to have, have an excuse to kill people, to see what it's like to watch life leave someone's eyes. You know, all the most terrible, sinister things you could think of. You know, this was normal. This was accepted. It was always the, the you know, the, the bourgeois, the rich elites, they were the ones that were allowed to be knights, not the common folk, right? So you had all these people of, you know, backgrounds of aristocracy, and it was all for interpersonal greed, you know, warfare for profit, story as old as time, I suppose. But the Templars, that was something different. You had these noble men of high status, high regard, a lot of wealth, you know, these people that were expected to have kids and extend their house, you know, to rule over the common folk, you know, to keep the serfs uh, in serfdom, you know, to keep the slaves in slavery, you know, and um, you know, these people that were just essentially the celebrities of our time, you know, <laughs> like the worst, like Seth Rogans of our time, the 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 James Francos of our times, uh, you know, the these superficial people. These rappers, these celebrities, the fake tits, you know, this, this is the kind of people, right? So enough of them realized that wealth wasn't real, right? And they thirsted for something. They thirsted for God. So these people of high upper class backgrounds joined this order. They gave all their money to the order and they were regimented, you know, not even just something that they could retire from. No, like they were to grow old and senile and pick up the sword and go, you know, and die horrific deaths. You know, they weren't allowed to have kids. They weren't allowed to extend their family line. Um, you know, they, they discarded their status, their wealth, and they protected Muslims and Jews. Very unheard of. Um, like, like they, they came from the most shittiest, backgrounds possible and we're not even talking conspiracy theories or gnosis just textbook definition and these people you know the, the, yeah they went to war for religious reasons for sure um and there, there were like the, the the person that founded the templars was a french nobleman who also raped teenage girls yeah it's like like not, it's not a clean background you know it's not just like i'm not trying to romanticize it there were bad things but there were way more good things because you have the most narcissistic, greedy, materialistic psychopaths that just fucking decided, you know what, I'm going to live in filth. I'm going to be covered in blood and mud and, and drenched in my own sweat. I'm going to be beaten. I'm going to have a strict prayer regimen and all of my money is going to be towards this organization that built a banking system that would allow the common folk not to be robbed in the middle of the desert. I'm going to fight for people I don't like. I'm going to fight for, you know, these, these Jewish pilgrims, these Muslim pilgrims, these Christian pilgrims, especially, um, you know, people that back home we would, can, we would spit on as we walk by them. I'm, and we're going, we're, I'm going to give all my money to this group. And this group is going to build hospitals, libraries, schools, completely unheard of like 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 that that is like probably one of the first genuine humanitarian groups in history like all religion aside their cross you take that away this is like the best the cream of the crop humanity had to offer these people would die childless in pain and agony um and they gave up everything to be a part of this group like and all the way till the end, they, they didn't denounce their cause. They didn't denounce their organization. All the way up till the end, they chose to burn at the literal fucking stake. When they could have sold out, they could have gotten a lot of money, right? Some of them did, and those became Freemasons. But these people believed in humanity so much that they were willing to die for it. They were willing to put their lives on it. That is something that is so profound that I've always wanted my entire life. Like, that is the best humanity has to offer. And they were all killed. You know, a, a shame, right? And I just see this world without knights, this world without samurais, this world without the Varangian guard, this world without Praetorians, this world without the Ulfidans, this world without the elite, uh, the good elite, you know, this world without the hero's mythos. 
you know, the, or the hero's ethos, rather. Um, it, it, there's no great cause, and it reminds me of that scene from Fight Club. We all know that scene, you know, uh, the, <laughs> all of us wanted to be celebrities, and now we woke up and we're fucking mad. But, um, man, I just, I see that, and I want that, and that's not easy, right? I've always said that I wanted that, but what have I done to, um, for, you know, to have that happen? Right? What have I done? Nothing. Nothing. I, you know, so this is the big reveal. Um, I just gave up my lease. I'm working two jobs. I just gave up my lease, um, you know, to someone who's going to move in very shortly. Where am I going to live? I'm going to live on the streets. All my stuff is going into storage. And I'm probably going to slowly get rid of most of my stuff. I'm going to start saving money. I'm going to accumulate money. Because, man, as someone that couldn't see properly for a long time, wanting to help people, and constantly borrowing money, borrowing money from my friend Joe, borrowing money from my dad, all these people that I owe money to, and just constantly taking and taking and taking and taking and taking, and then buying shit that I don't need. Uh, you know, <sighs> wanting to pay off my debts, spiritually, packs I made with gods. Um, physically, people I owe, and just the promise I made to God, that I made to the monad, that I made to Brahman. Um, you know, I, I, you know, Jacques de Molay, like, I, I invoked him in a spiritual ritual, and he said, you're not going to be a Templar. If you were, it would just be for the symbol, you know? If you were to be a Templar, it would just be another thing for you, another virtue signal, another thing. But if you were, like the spirit of this great dead man said, if you were to live our way of life, if you were to die to the world, if you were to take a vow of poverty, chastity, and obedience, obedience to greater principles, you know, if you were to live like us and every other thing other than name, you would be a Templar in the truest sense, even without being one. My glasses, I'm just thinking, man, I wish I could help someone see, right? The basic dignity, the basic human dignity of having, you know, the full extent of one of your five senses, or six senses. Um, you know, and I have a friend named Evan, a co-worker, um, who has gone months without, you know, being able to see properly. Like, the amount of times I was working with him and thought, I wish I could just fucking pay out of pocket and, like, buy him glasses, you know, so he can see, right? I, my friends that are in debt, I have a friend that owes their uncle a lot of money. They should have the dignity of living without debt, you know? I, all these people that are suffering, all my friends that can barely afford to provide for their children, I just wish I could send, like, $500 or even $1,000 over Cash App and just be like, you don't owe me anything. This is for your kid. Be a, good, be a good father and, and, and help your kids survive. You know, that's, that's what I want. Um, and I can't do that. I mean, I want 30% of my income to go to charity, right? And paying rent, you know, um, buying all this food and all this stuff. Uh, like, could you, the person watching this, could you at this point in your life donate 30% of what you make? You have too many expenses. You have kids. You have, um, you know, your your rent, your your mortgage, whatever it is, you, down payments on your car. Um, like, you can't do it. And it, it's not expected of you to do it. I'm not trying to be like, I'm better than you. Because, you, you know, like, this is not any way of life that I would wish on another human being. But this is the way of life I have to choose. I want to be a knight, or rather a Templar surgeon, um, because that was the rank of the... Uh, common folk that joined the Templars. They wore black, and the noblemen wore white. Um, but, uh, and the surgeons were given higher ranks than the, the, the typical white ones, so, you know. Uh, the, <laughs> but anyways, um, you know, I want to be like a Templar surgeon, you know. Um, and, and I know I can live outside of the system. I know I don't have to validate the banks. I want to be able to walk into my bank and say to them, I'm closing my account. Because I believe that you're everything that's wrong with this society. I believe that you're investing, um, 
you know, our money, our, you know, savings, our checkings, we are investing that into organizations that are leading to the moral decay of Western civilization. I hate you, and I think you're an evil organization. I, I to, to bury my money in the desert, right? Um, to say that I will not tolerate this. Because to, here's the thing. I had a friend that was a part of a nationalist organization, um, and uh, once it was revealed that he was a part of this group, uh, his life savings, we're talking over $10,000 uh, that was for his kids, um, you, legally, because it's a private institution, not a public institution, certain banks, if they decide they don't like your political views, they can freeze your account and absorb your funds. Is that freedom of speech? Should I have to worry about wanting to do the right thing and loving my nation and then worry about my life savings being frozen? And then there's another thing, you know, these celebrities will take out over $500,000 to buy a car and destroy it for YouTube views, right? And that's expected of them, right? The, the feds aren't bothered by that. The glowies don't care. However, did you know, legally, if you take out over $10,000 of your own savings and you withdraw it, your bank legally has to file a tax form that goes to the Treasury and the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And they put you on a watch list because they suspect that if you're in the lower class or lower middle class and you are spending your money in a suspicious way, it's not that you're doing anything legitimate with it. You must be involved with something involving drugs, soliciting, dirty money, laundering, whatever it is, insider trading. You know, you, you don't even have the dignity of having your own money. Right. And, the, and then if you actually physically have a certain amount on you, legally that can be seized. There was a, an African-American veteran who I think was driving through Arizona, gets pulled over by the police. They open his trunk and they see his life savings. He was moving from one place to place. So he closed his account. He took his money. He was driving. He was probably going to deposit it somewhere else. They said that the amount of money he had was suspicious and they took his money away. Oh, isn't that spooky? And he had to fight, and he finally got his money um, after, you know, a big old legal battle, but he spent more money on the legal battle than the money he got back, right? So they can legally take your money if, if it's just too much of a suspicious amount. My money is my own money, thank you very much. I don't want to have to worry about being put on a fucking glowy watch list um, and being, you know, like, then thinking that I'm, like, cooking crystal meth. Like, no, my money is my money, and it's none of your goddamn business. If I want to take, you know, over $10,000, um, out of my account in pennies, there's nothing you can fucking do about it. <sighs> you know, I want...